Welcome everybody. Where are we here? There we go. There we go. I think everything's good. I am here uh, flying solo today. So let me know if you guys can hear me, please. I think everybody, everything should be working as far as the uh, live stream goes. Um, just logging on my TV so I can see you guys. There we go. Live chat's up, perfect. All right. There we go, all good. Excellent. Okay, so we are, welcome everybody to the live. Uh, welcome to the lighter side of RC after dark. Um, it is not after dark anymore. Our days are starting to get longer and it's still light outside for probably another uh, hour or so here. Uh, it hasn't stopped snowing since I got back from Tucson, which has been tons of fun. Um, so, it's interesting. We've got lots to do tonight. We are flying solo. We've got nobody in the shop except me and Nez is sleeping on the, uh, on the chair right there. I've got my laptop up here so I can see you guys. Uh, the comments are a little bit slow on my laptop, but uh, they're there. So let's see, Nick. Nick, I've got a package here from you that we're going to open as well too. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you for the congratulations on the maidens. They all went very well. Dale, hey, how you doing? Kevin, hi. Walter Mitty, nice. Um, good morning. Good evening. Hey, Ward, I'm glad you can make it on from Thailand. <laughs> That's crazy. What time is it in Thailand, Ward? Waz is on from Tasmania. Hey, Kelly, how are you? Juicy. Yo. Super cool. Awesome. So I'll be keeping track of the, uh, of the comments on there. I think this is the best way to do it. Um, the reason I'm sitting here rather than like moving around is we got a lot of this stuff to cover. Also got a ton of email questions. So thank you to everybody that sent an email question in. That's super cool. Um, so a little summary of the past three weeks. It's been three weeks since we did a live and uh, lots happened in three weeks. We basically spent 10 days uh, in Tucson. Well, we spent three days driving to Tucson, six days in Tucson, uh, five days in Tucson, and then two days driving back. It was a ton of driving. Yes, I got my tan on, which is awesome. Uh, hey, David, how are you? North Star said jets flew great. Yes, they did. Eight o'clock in the morning, Ward, super cool. Um, I did come back with a little bit of a cold. I'm feeling better though, so, but if you hear me like <clears throat> clearing my throat and stuff, that's, that's why. Uh, Klaus, how are you? Thanks for your comments today on the video. Uh, I, I saw them, I haven't replied to them yet. Your comments to the other guy that was commenting, I appreciate it. Okay, I will keep track of the comments, but let's dive in. Um, we'll do the, uh, the things I wanted to touch on first. So. Tucson Jets. We went to Tucson Jets. It was so much fun. Uh, the weather obviously was way warmer than it is here. You can see out the door there. We've got lots of snow and uh, it's beautiful down there. Uh, long drive. Lots of great pilots showed up. So we actually were at the field on Tuesday and uh, we did the, the maiden on my Rebel, uh, on Stacy's Rebel and uh, had a kind of a good catch up day. Wednesday we had some great flights, flew the Kinetics on Wednesday and uh, people started to show up on Thursday. The weather on Friday kind of sucked and uh, so we ended up going to the Pima Air Museum. If you're ever in Arizona and uh, you, or Tucson and you have the chance to go to the Air Museum, I highly suggest it. It is unbelievable. Like you can walk up to the F-14 and touch it, look inside the wheel wells, there's an SR-71 there, there's everything. It's absolutely amazing. Um, so cool. Yeah, Kelly was with us at the museum. Uh, it was amazing. So, uh, yeah, it was super cool. Um, so that was Tucson Jets. That's basically what we've been doing for the past three weeks. Uh, we had a whole bunch of planes to finish for Tucson Jets. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up at the beginning of this is my Kinetics is for sale and my Super Alan is for sale. I, I posted on Facebook the other day that my Kinetics may be for sale. It is. If any of you guys that are watching this are interested, 
uh, shoot me an email and we can discuss pricing and stuff. I have got three interested people already, so if you are interested and really wanna jump on it, I suggest not waiting because those deals are just kind of working out right now, So, but nothing's firm as of yet. Uh, Super Alan, also for sale. I would prefer to sell that without the engine so I can take the engine out and put it in my new BDX that's coming. Um, but I'll, I'll sell it either way, it doesn't really matter. So if you are interested in the Super Alan or the Kinetics, shoot me an email, thelightersideofrc at gmail.com. Third thing that I wrote down before I get to your guys' questions is the master course. So we don't have a firm date yet. I've got more ideas brewing in my head, but we are doing, going to do a master course in spring. What is the master course? Um, some of you guys have reached out. I've, I've put little plugs and stuff on Facebook and in my videos. Please don't comment here and expect me to add you to the list. Please send me an email, thelightersideofrc at gmail.com and just say I'm interested in the course. Uh, there's no commitment there. All that's doing is saying when I get all the details organized, I'm going to send you the information first. The master course is basically going to be here at the shop. So you have to fly to Canada or for your local, come to the shop. And uh, the reason we're doing it in spring is so you can pair it up with a nice kind of vacation. There's lots of amazing things to see around where I live. And uh, spring and summer are definitely the best times to visit. And uh, the master course is going to be an entire Saturday, half a day Sunday. Lunch will be provided on sun, uh, Saturday. We're gonna, I don't know what'll happen in the evening on Saturday, and then we'll do half a day on Sunday. And we're gonna limit it to probably eight to 12 people, somewhere in that range. So it's a first come, first serve basis. I'm not gonna start adding more people just because space and, and, uh, and everything is important to me. Uh, I also want it to be more like a one-on-one -on -one class. So the people that sign up for the class are going to decide what is covered in the class. So part of the sign up is, hey, what do you wanna learn? What do you wanna pick my brain on? What do you wanna spend time doing? And the content of the course will be based around that. Um, it's a good time to pick my brain, one-on-one -on -one type stuff. And uh, we've got a ton of interest already. So once we get things kind of nailed down, um, if you wanna be on the list to find out pricing, when it is, all that stuff, please send me an email. Um, I have no way of adding you to the email list without you sending me an email. So that's it, that's the stuff I had in place. Um, just gonna take a look here. F-18 is still for sale in the rafters, yes it is. No, Ward, I had to get the BDX. Hey Kyle, Ward is in Thailand. What a bugger, I don't blame him. He's been having a blast there for a week, so. All right. Uh, Kyle, I did get your message. I just have been busy, so, but I will get that information to you tomorrow. So let's get into the nuts and bolts of everything. We got a bunch of questions to cover, but the first thing, Nick, I opened up your package already, but I just tucked it back in because I wanted to, uh, to show everybody. Thank you for sending this uh, all the way from Taranaki, New Zealand. That's super cool. And uh, Nick sent me... I think this will show up on the camera. I can't see what my camera's viewing, but thank you, Nick, for that. I appreciate it. That is super cool. I can see it on the TV now. Awesome. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Love getting little tidbits in the mail like that. That's super cool. Um, the stuff that's on the table here, when we did the Rebel Pro build, I designed the GS200 flush mount, and there's been some people that have reached out to me and said, hey, can I buy the flush mount? So I just printed black, white, and red, and um, these will be added to the, uh, the website as well soon. They're the exact same design that I, uh, that I installed on the Rebel Pro. And then also, these have been here at the shop for a while. These are from Joe. These are the smaller battery mounts. Um, I just haven't had any time to, uh, to add these to the website. So the smaller battery mounts in wood will be added soon. Um, okay, just checking on comments. 
All right, so we got a bunch of questions from you guys. Thank you so much for the questions. Uh, we've got a ton, and that's why I set this up, because I think we're going to spend a fair bit of time going over these questions. And if you guys have any other questions while we're going through this stuff, uh, just comment on the live chat, and I will see the, uh, the comments here um, on my, my screen. So, All right, so Bill, my friend Bill, sent me a message and, uh, or an email, and we've got a seven questions. So I'm going to go over each one of these individually. Uh, transmitter layout... Uh, he said, or he asked, how do you, Jonathan, do it? What sticks, buttons, sliders, etc., on the TX for which function? The DS16, preferably from Jetty. Should I replace some of my DS16 switches? I have a lot of two position switches that I'm thinking about replacing with three position switches. So let me grab my radio and I will come to the front there and uh, I'll show you guys exactly what my layout looks like. So there is no right or wrong on radio setup. I'm just waiting for me to show up in the TV so I can see if this is working. So there's no right or wrong on radio setup. Um, it's going to be whatever is familiar for you. One thing I would suggest is if you've been flying for like 25 years with a certain layout, probably not a good idea to change it. I've seen accidents happen when people do that. Um, so my, my layout's always been the same for me and... Uh, David, who I, I uh, do a lot of planes for, his is a little bit different. So um, as far as the radio goes, this is kind of the generic uh, gear switch right there. Uh, I have seen people do something different, but this is, is basically the gear switch. Pretty much every radio follows that same layout. Now I use this switch here for my, it's a three position switch, for my flight modes or flaps. Okay, so this is really my, my flap switch. Uh, David, who we build planes for, um, this is the flight mode or flap switch that he uses. Um, generally, I will use this switch. It's a two-position switch on my radio for lights, master lights on off. That'll be my master lights on off. Now, the reason I use or I, I started using this switch for flaps was, let's say you're doing a, uh, you're coming in for a landing and you need to do a go around. Well, generally you're throttling up. Sometimes you're taking the flaps off, so it's right there. Also with my hand, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to have my flap switch here because it's a little more complicated for me to get to. Um, on my Jetty radio, this is my master on off switch right here. It's a locking switch, and this is my gyro on off. Um, this can also be a three position switch. It'll still work as a gyro on off, but I switched mine. I think I switched this to a two position. This switch is, I don't really use for anything. And uh, this is kind of my accessory switch. I used to use this for buddy boxing right here, but uh, I've started using, or I've always really used this for, let me take a step back. I did start using this as my buddy box switch, but I always use this as my smoke on off switch. So what I've done is I've gone back to using this, this for a smoke if I have a plane with smoke and I've been using this back slider as my buddy box switch. Brakes, I always do brakes right here on this side. Reason being when you land, you're steering the plane, you're no longer using this stick and you should be putting your brakes on. I see some guys do their brakes on this side. Uh, I flew the Tudor down in Tucson, my old Tudor and the brakes were here and it was pretty difficult for me because I'm busy steering and trying to put the brakes on and it doesn't really work that well. Uh, this is air brake is what I use it for if a plane has an air brake. So that is basically what we do. Uh, eight is always my volume control and uh, it's basically it. Canopy, if, if it has a canopy open close, we're generally using SN for canopy open close. So. That's the layout that I use. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. Close said, Jetty's phenomenal with customizing layouts. Yeah, you can do anything anywhere, but uh, what the, the one thing that I suggest is just consistency. Um, you shouldn't have to have different labels or think about where your switches are. 
You know, when I'm holding my radio, I know where my gyro on off, I know where my gear switch is, my flap switch, without even having to look down, that's important. Uh, Kelly said it would be great to show a schematic layout of the clone to CB unit to Cortex and remote switch. We can do that, Kelly. Definitely can. Nick said nice and logical. Thank you, Nick. Okay, so question number two from Bill. Hopefully you're on, Bill. Um, Sweewin fuel pumps. Can I shorten the double connection loop? So on the, on the Sweewin fuel pumps on the 140 and down, uh, there's four nipples on the Sweewin fuel pump. On the 140 and down, you've got a loop built into the fuel pump. You can shorten that loop. There's nothing wrong with shortening that loop. You just want to make sure that, that, that your four millimeter line isn't going to get kinked. That's important. But on, uh, I have done installs where I've shortened the loop. That's no problem. Um, you can't use a different pump. Uh, it is a brushless pump, so it's very specific to the fuel system. Uh, can I adjust the lengths of my Sweewin cables, engine to GSU, GSU to battery? Yes, you can. Uh, engine to GSU, uh, you want to make sure you're using an appropriate size wire. So I actually have a whole, I think it's a thousand foot spool of Sweewin wire. So if you are watching this and you do uh, order a Sweewin turbine from me, just ask me for an extra piece of wire and I can send it to you. Um, but uh, you shouldn't go too long on the, on the length. So you should limit it to about three feet. I think the stock wire is about uh, two-ish feet, so you can add about another foot on there. I have gone a little bit longer without any issues, and it's been a non-issue. Non so um, GSU to battery, uh, make it as long as you need to, but um, keep the GSU or the ECU to turbine as short as possible. Uh, fuel tubing, where should I use Tigon versus Festo? So, in, I know if you look back on some of my builds, you've seen Tigon mixed in. I like to use Tigon inside tanks and, uh, or Viton tubing, which is the black tubing. It also comes in clear. So that's where I'll use Tigon. Uh, I'll use it on like a fill line. Um, but everywhere else I'm basically using Festo tubing because it's not collapsible um, is the general consensus. So try and use Festo everywhere that you can is probably the best way to say it. Um, the recommended 3S battery, so this is question number five from Bill. Recommended 3S battery capacity for the one battery to rule them all configuration. And yes, we flew my Rebel Classic, Stacy's Rebel Classic, the Super Bandit, David's Rebel Classic, four airplanes down there with all having one battery. And guess what? It works amazing. Um, in my Rebel Classic, it's a 2S battery because my Zykoi turbine uses two cell LiPo and I'm using a 5,000 milliamp battery. Uh, in Stacy's Rebel Classic, because it's a Sweewin turbine, uh, we're using a 3S, three cell LiPo battery, and the battery we balanced his plane out with was the 3,300 milliamp three cell LiPo, and it balances perfect, and uh, he gets three flights on there, no problem. It's basically on his airplane, it's using 700 milliamps per flight. That's everything, right? Turbine gear, controls, everything. So 3,300 milliamps, he uh, does three flights. He basically um, took about 55% out of the battery, something like that. So three flights was a non-issue. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the battery size. I would suggest like 3,300 to 5,000, depending on uh, the amount of weight you need. And uh, also... Um, the, the setup, right, is, is key as well. So in your case, you're using a sweet wind turbine. So I would go with like the 3300 would be a good option or bigger if you need it or can fit it in. Um, measuring CG without a fancy schmancy tool. <laughs> Tank, fuel levels, gear position, etc. So 
Always balance your planes, your jets, in landing configuration. That's the simplest way to think about it. So with a Rebel Classic, you're never landing with zero fuel in the fuel tank. If you are, that's a big problem. So when I balanced my Rebel Classic, I put about 750 milliliters in the fuel tank, which is uh, about 20% fuel left. And uh, that's where we balanced it, right? The fuel tank's in front of the CG, so it does affect it. Um, gear down, UAT full. Uh, if your plane has a fuel tank right over the CG, then having fuel or not having fuel isn't gonna matter. But in your case, you're working on a, um, a Boomerang Ranger right now. The fuel tank is in front of the CG point. So you wanna have fuel in your fuel tank. I would put a quarter tank of fuel in that aircraft when you balance the CG. Um, so Klaus said the ECU to turbine wire is not critical length, is it? Uh, not really, but um, the recommended from Sweewin is you should keep it around 36 inches max. Um, so that is uh, uh, question number six from Bill. Oh, measuring CG without a fancy schmancy tool. Um, you can use a string with uh, a knot on the end of the string, squish it between the, uh, the wings. Um, you can make a jig that mounts on the, the wing tube. Um, one of the fancy non-technical tools that I have is a piece of string with two of the old Futaba round uh, horns on it. Now on a big scale jet, you don't wanna use that, but on like a sports jet, that you know doesn't weigh a ton, no problem at all. You tuck those underneath the wings, you install the wings, you get the string set on the CG point, you lift it up and that's it. So there's lots of different ways to accomplish it. And last question Bill had was wire routing. Which wires, if any, should I try to keep away from what wires and electronics? Um, <clears throat> generally, I would say, like, I'm thinking about the SU-30. We, when we did that plane, we basically put all the control wires on the right side of the plane. All of the power wire is on the left side of the plane. Um, obviously, there's going to be intersections there at some point, but that's really what we did. Um, is just keep the power wire away from the control wire. Uh, is it critical? Maybe not, but you know, the bull, bull suffered interference on the V-Speak unit. So uh, when we install a V-Speak unit, we keep the V-Speak kind of separate from any other items. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Awesome, thanks Bill. Uh, Ward said, would, would you not fly with less than 50% battery? Not really, Ward. I, like, on my Rebel as an example, what I did when I was down there was two flights and recharge. That's just the easiest way to do it. Um, it. All your planes, if you do three flights and recharge, that's just the easiest way to do it. Always keep those systems in place because it keeps your planes alive. All right. So that is questions from Bill. Um, <clears throat> okay, so Edgardo said, uh, hey Jonathan and your crew, watching the Super Bandit video, I noticed they use different way of trimming the jet in flight under clean and full flap configuration. Is that related to the different flight modes of flight? Normally when I trim my airplanes that has flaps, it becomes like random setting for the flap versus elevator until I have the desired mix ratio between those two channels. <laughs> uh, he also asked about the ECU offline during maiden flight. We'll get to that. So, uh, and this, this question from Edgardo also ties into another one that came in from Michael just tonight before the live started. Um, so, I'll, I'll also bring up this question as well too because it ties into the exact same thing. So Michael said, hey Jonathan, can you explain the different flight modes on the Voodoo Scheme Rebel Classic 
and the purpose and benefits of each flight mode. So it, it ties into both airplanes. So um, if you think about uh, the flight modes we have on our radio, we've got essentially in its simplest form, you have three flight modes, but there are more possibilities, right? So the flight modes in its simplest form are normal flight, uh, takeoff flaps, landing flaps. But on something like the, um, the Rebel Classic, there are times when you may want to do a slow pass with your, your flaps fully extended. So that's going to be a different trim setting than when your gear is down, right? So having an additional flight mode that's tied up to your, tied into your gear up is also beneficial. So really you could have uh, five different flight modes. So you could have your um, regular flying flight mode, a uh, takeoff flap with gear down, takeoff flap with gear up, landing flap with gear down, landing flap with gear up, and they could all be different trims. When you have your gear down, that's gonna add additional down trim. So when you have your gear up, it'll be a different trim setting. So that's the reason for those different flight modes and those different trims on all the flight modes. Um, with something like a, a Rebel Classic, you can program sort of where they need to be, but all the final adjustment needs to be in the radio. So that's why the first three minutes of that video is just trimming the, the, uh, the plane out in all those different characteristics or conditions. And once that's done, it just is, is done. It's super simple. Um, the Super Band, it's very much the same as well too. Same kind of scenario. So... Uh, Kelly asked if Kaya ordered a Rebel. So when my daughter came with me down to, uh, to uh, Tucson, she had a blast. I posted a picture on Facebook and she has never held a radio before, ever. And uh, she did a buddy box session with Patrick, Kelly's son. And uh, she flew a jet for the first time. That was her first time ever holding a radio, ever flying anything. And it was awesome. She did three circuits with the jet. And uh, we haven't ordered a Rebel Classic yet. She hasn't given me any money for it, so. But if we do sell the Kinetics and the Super Alan, things can change. Have fun, Ward. Have a great day. Uh, Nick said, be kinder in your battery as well. Yes, if you don't drain it so much. So those are the questions from Michael and uh, Edgardo. Oh, yeah, there's more here. So also what caused the ECU offline in the maiden flight? So during the Rebel, or the, uh, oh, now I can feel like I'm talking normal. Sorry, my 3D printer's been going all day. Uh, the Super Bandit had a ECU offline condition. And I think uh, during the video, David mentioned that it's just, uh, it was information overload or something like that. So that's, that was the reason for it. Uh, the flame out on the second flight, I think, was just high speed. Uh, maybe it was a bubble in the UAT. And uh, Patrick was pushing the second flight a lot more than Coco did on the first flight. And uh, I will, uh, I'll let you guys know, since you're, if you're watching this, you're probably true fans. A week from today on Saturday, there's an Easter egg at the end of the Rebel Pro video. So the Rebel Pro video has already been uploaded. Channel members have already seen it because channel members can watch early. Uh, but there's an Easter egg at the end of that video during my pictures I always add in. And uh, that's all I'll say. So check that picture out, little Easter egg for all you viewers. All right, so let's see here. So we got that one. All right, last question that I have uh, from email is from Sheldon. So Sheldon said, are you going to use any fuel bags for U.S. customers that you know of? I'm wondering where to buy them and would love to see you set up some because uh, one would be great on my Mephisto. So Danny at, uh, at, from Aeropanda, uh, he posted a picture a, few, a couple weeks back and uh, 
So Danny's got a Kinetics that uh, his, is actually his second Kinetics now. And he's replacing the tank in the Kinetics with a fuel bag setup. Um, so it's going to be kind of cool to see that. The picture he posted of the fuel bag with the two, um, two rods that the fuel bag sits in or on or part of. Um, that is the fuel bag that's going in the Kinetics. So I'm sure we'll start doing some of it, more of it. Uh, it's still not legal in Canada. Maybe it will be eventually. Usually when things happen on the, on the U.S. side, they eventually come here. Um, it would be kind of a cool thing to, uh, to have in the arsenal. I think on sports, sports jets, it would be pretty cool. Um, obviously, scale planes depends on how much room you have. So um, We'll probably have some more stuff like that coming. But uh, I think it's going to be a bit of a slow progression with, uh, with things. I also had a discussion with Joe from RC Custom 3D Printing. He, uh, Joe did the, uh, the new fuel system for me, the V3 or V4 fuel system. I can't remember what it is. I installed it before we went to Tucson. It was awesome to have down there. Thank you, Joe, for that. And uh, we had a discussion the other day about fuel bags and his, his, um, his fueler system and, and all that. So there's, there's some cool things that, uh, that he's working on as well too. So that is the stuff. F-16 sitting right there. Um, <clears throat> yeah. If you guys have any questions during this live, just ask away. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit Maybe, well, it's going to be less shaky because there's nobody holding the camera, so. Hmm. Our, um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> uh, the RC Air Experience, our podcast channel. Uh, we're doing two podcasts recording, two podcasts next week. Um, so those will be released over the next little bit here. We're just playing catch up with, uh, with being so busy. So that's also coming as well, too. And uh, yeah, back in the saddle. So let's do some stuff. All right, I'm gonna flip you guys around. There we go. Perfect. <clears throat> All right, now we're gonna get a little bit shaky. Sorry about that. Uh, Edgardo, did David, David physically flew a Super Bandit? He didn't, so Coco flew the first flight. Um, he wanted Patrick to fly it. Patrick's got tons of experience with Super Bandits, and uh, he flew the second flight. He was happy with it, put it away, and uh, he will fly it in California. So um, F-16 is here. We are ready to bolt the fuselage together. So we've been waiting to continue with the F-16. So on YouTube, we've done three videos. Video number four will be out on Wednesday. That catches us up to where we are right now. And uh, we're continuing with the F-16. So lots to accomplish there. We have accomplished lots since we got back from Tucson. And uh, I'll, I'll show you guys kind of a bit of a summary here. I'll flip you around for that. <clears throat> so, We've got, uh, worked on a bunch of things over the past, well, yesterday and today. So pipes installed, all the wiring's installed, that's all run forward, tail cones installed, we've got our afterburner light in there, uh, the white paint, the BVM ceramic paint is all done. We're gonna touch that up as well too, so it's black. And uh, you're welcome, Kelly. I was happy to help and drop your plane off. So that is good, we've got our pipe installed. We've got our smoke tanks installed and complete. These are the ones that Joe made up for us. Uh, the, the last thing we did just before, um, Jet Junkie, I'll get to your question in a second here. So last thing we did just before we uh, started the live was get the bypass lower fit and screwed in. And we got the, um, the front intake portion cut. So you can see my marks there, my paint marks. So before we can do anything else with like plumbing, tanks and everything, we need to bolt the front fuselage on because our bolts come in from this direction here. So our tanks need to come out, intake needs to come out to access all those bolts. We're gonna do some extra stuff on the fuselage joining, but that is where our F-16 is. 
Big boxes in the background. What are, what's in the big boxes? Well, let's see here. There we go. That's what's in the big boxes. A Bronco. <coughs> so yes, we've got a Bronco coming. Or well, Bronco's here. Um, we're gonna do the unboxing probably tomorrow. Not sure when that video is gonna be released. The Bronco is going off to paint. So the Bronco is actually being stripped, glassed, painted, uh, panel lines installed, drop tanks done, weathered, nomenclature installed. Uh, and then it comes back to me and we do the, uh, the installation. So it's gonna be fun. Um, what else here? Oh yeah, Super Alan, well, without its booms installed, it's for sale. And uh, we've been going crazy with 3D printers as well too. So there's gonna be some videos released on 3D printers. So we got the new Chidi Tech in about three weeks ago. Couldn't talk about this because uh, we couldn't say anything until March 20th. Been loving this thing. We've printed a whole spool of this red filament through it. This is uh, carbon PLA and just been printing a whole bunch of cool stuff and it's working absolutely amazing. Uh, the Creality K1 Max just opened this up yesterday. So this kind of replaces my old Chidi Max, uh, much smaller printer right there. Um, same build volume as the Chidi, well close to it anyways. So this is, uh, we're just printing a bunch of things on that guy. So anyways, been going crazy with 3D printer stuff. Uh, here's the mess for the F-16. Been working on that all day, more F-16 stuff. And the Lukey stand. Thanks David for the Lukey stand. Already putting it to good use here in the shop. And of course the BDX, which will start very, very, soon. So upcoming projects, uh, BDX, of course, uh, we, let's see here, we've got our um, Rebel Hot, that's going to be starting very soon. F-14, uh, engines should be here soon, doesn't really matter though because we've got to get the 16 finished first. Uh, we've got the SU-30, our engines are finally showing up, they were probably shipping out on Monday, or they will be shipping out on Monday, Tuesday, and uh, the SU-30 will be finished. So that is exciting. Yes, that's all the stuff. Okay, so I'll flip you guys around. <clears throat> Let's see here. Uh, so Jet Junkie said, what's the advantage of using a fuel bag? Um, bi the biggest thing is it's lighter. Um, that's probably not actually the biggest thing. One of the significant things, I'm gonna put you guys down so I'm not so shaky. Just give me a second. There we go. Uh, one, of the, one of the huge benefits is weight, but also um, if you think about a fuel bag, the way it works is it's, you know, you're filling it up with fuel, there's no air in the, in the bag. So you actually don't need to use a UAT with a fuel bag, uh, so a bubble tank. Um, you could use more of your fuel capacity. So when you're using a standard fuel tank setup, you know, if this is like your, your side profile or your fuel tank, you know, you're always landing with kind of like a quarter tank of fuel because you want to keep that, the pickup inside the, the fuel. You know, when you're a quarter tank of fuel, you probably don't want to go too crazy on maneuvers. But when you think about a fuel bag, you can run that bag till there's almost nothing left. So that's probably the biggest advantage. Uh, so thinking about something like the Kinetics, if you had a six liter hard tank in there, which is what's in the Kinetics, and you put a five liter fuel bag in there, uh, generally when I fly my Kinetics, uh, I'm usually only using three liters of fuel. So there's still like two and a half, three liters of fuel left on board. So you can go with a lot smaller fuel bag, like let's say four and a half, five liters, and suck that thing almost dry. So there's quite a few benefits to the fuel bags. Uh, you wanna make sure that you don't, uh, um, it's not rubbing on anything. There's lots of restrictions with it, so. Um, let's see here. 
Hey, Kenneth, should, uh, should have you do an OV-10 for Ad Senior? He flew them back in the day. Oh, cool, super cool. Yeah, this is a, I think it's gonna be a great plane. Um, we're putting, this oh, This one's gonna be electric and, and the owner, Kyle, he actually flew them as well too. So, um, Philip, I need one. Everybody needs one. Foreman Nez, Nez has been in a mood all day and she's finally sleeping in her chair. She's been on my case all day long going bonkers so that's what's been going on uh joe said where did you end up putting the pickup and vent in the smoke tanks on the f-16 perfect i'll show you that stuff good question joe good question since you made the tanks <clears throat> So I was initially gonna put, so these tanks, I, I didn't plumb them in parallel, so they're plumbed in series. So what that means is uh, this one is gonna fill first. So if we're filling the smoke system, it's gonna come to the bung fitting here, fill up the tank, come out the vent, go to the other smoke tank, which is over here, fill up the tank, and come out the vent line, which is right there. So vent line I ended up putting just right on top. I can actually probably show you right there. That's where the vent is and the bung is right there. So um, I was just going to do <clears throat> a, uh, a fitting glued in the bottom of the last tank. Um, because it doesn't need a pickup if it's pulling into the first tank, but I just figured I'd keep it simple and use the same bung setup and everything on it. So that's, that's where we ended up putting the, uh, the fittings on the tanks, but they fit perfect. Um, Philip, you said, or Philip is saying smoke nozzle, would you put it behind the engine or the end of the pipe outside the back? I'm gonna raise you guys up again. <clears throat> See you, Kyle. Say hi to Jill for me as well, too. Um, so, Philip, to ask, answer your question, generally I would put those right behind the turbine. Uh, I have run a smoke nozzle to the very back of the pipe before. I did it on my one of my ultra flashes, I used a big long section of brass tube. I think it was like three feet long and it actually ran in between the walls of the pipe and so the inner and outer pipe. And then I just bent it down at the end of the pipe. It worked fine, but uh, it's cleaner, easier, um, I think better smoke if it's right behind the turbine. And on this F-16 we're doing, I didn't disappear, I just crouched down. On this F-16, we are doing two smoke nozzles. So these guys right here from DreamWorks. All right. So Gardo, for old school builders like me, I am considering in investing in a laser woodcutter and 3D printer. So if you have to choose one of them, what would be your advice? Ooh. I definitely use my 3D printers much more than my laser cutter. Um, really the only thing that I use my laser unit a lot for is to make these shims for servos. Uh, these are the shims that I used in the Rebel uh, builds and uh, there's people that have contacted me and asked me to buy these so that's why I printed a, or cut out a bunch but that's pretty much what I use my laser unit for the most. Um, I mean, obviously it's super useful, but a lot of it is design stuff and it's a little bit more tricky. So if you're picking between those two, I would definitely go with a 3D printer first. And uh, I feel like you'll get a lot more use out of the 3D printer. Um, I do at least, I print a bunch of things for it. It's usually running kind of every day or so. Yeah, so that's, uh, hopefully that answers your question. Um, yeah, so I think that is catch or that it's caught us all up. Just going to make a little spot for you guys. 
And we are going to continue working on our F-16. Tuck this back over. There we go. Gonna pull the computer over so I can see your guys' comments and not have to work away on the phone. Sorry for the jiggly camera, just rearranging. There we go, that's better. Oh yeah. So good. So good, that's awesome. I think that'll work good. Okay, so if you guys have any comments, I can still see them if you have any questions. Perfect. How many people attended Tucson Jets? Um, I think on the Saturday, there was uh, 50 registered pilots um, at that point. So it was about 50, 55 or something like that. So great event. Uh, there was never a time, I was saying this to Stacy on our, our drive home, uh, there was never a time that we wanted to fly that we couldn't fly. So there wasn't like a huge lineup. Like when you go to some of these events like uh, Kentucky Jets, as an example, um, you're waiting in line to fly your plane. So it gets a little bit tedious sometimes. Uh, this event, we were just hanging out, sitting in the chairs in the shade on, under the cover. And when we wanted to fly, we would just go fly. So it was a great event. A uh, good number of people. It kind of reminded me of Montana Jets. So Montana Jets is very similar in size. Um, well, it was a little bit smaller, but uh, it's very similar as far as the, um, the general feel and everything goes. So. Area 51, how are ya? Kelly counted about 87 jets. That's super cool. Yeah, there was lots of planes there. I mean, there's a lot of planes that didn't fly either. But um, yeah, there's lots of, uh, lots of cool planes there. Pretty much a smattering of everything. BVM was there, so there was lots of BVM jets as well that, uh, that were there. So what I'm doing is I've got to take the bypass out uh, to get the tanks out to bolt the fuselage together. So that is the goal of this episode tonight is get the fuselage rear bolted to the fuselage front. <clears throat> So this lower bypass, uh, this actually was the bypass for, uh, this was the bypass upper for my F4 uh, that I built last year. So that's what, uh, that's what we're using it on. Uh, obviously the shape is not suitable for a 400 Newton engine, which is why when we spread it out and it gets bolted to the former work, it fits beautifully. All right. Yeah, yeah, the F-16 is, uh, well, I mean, once we get the nose bolted on, it'll be bigger too, but it definitely, it's such a smaller plane in girth and everything. Um, one thing that's really cool about, uh, like when we went to the Pima Air Museum, it's really neat to see these planes in person. Like when you see the F-14 in person, it is huge. Uh, when you see the F-16 in person, it's tiny. Um, what plane was I shocked at? Oh, the MiG, MiG-17. I couldn't believe how small the MiG was. They've got a couple MiGs there and they are like, they're not very big planes. So uh, it was pretty neat to see those in person. Uh, let's see here. Kelly said, we're now getting pounded by a snowstorm. How's your weather? Oh, you want to see it, Kelly? I'll show you. Um, 
Uh, Hassel said, I generally do people let other people fly their planes at events. Uh, it, that's obviously going to depend on who it is. Um, I love to have a buddy box set up on my planes. So, you know, a complete newbie can fly my planes, no problem. And, uh, but it depends on, on your relationship with people for sure. So, so yeah, it hasn't uh, stopped snowing for many days now and it's still snowing right now. So there's a shot outside the shop uh, that our Nissan there hasn't moved for two days. Yeah, we got lots of snow. So we've gotten about 30 centimeters so far. 30 centimeters is, uh, I don't know what it is. Three inches or something like that, I don't know. Maybe it's more. Too much brain power to figure that out right now. There we go. Nissan's tired. Nissan is tired. Nissan. Her name's LaFonda. Hopefully it doesn't offend anybody, but that's what I call my, my black Nissan. So LaFonda is very tired. She did a great job driving all the way down to Tucson and back. What is snow? Yes, Victor. Yes, I know. Uh, what did Kelly say? Kenneth said on the Super Alan, wasn't there a model that was nitro that was smaller? Um, the alan has been out for a long time, but any of the boomerang models have always been turbine powered. Philip, are you sure you want some snow? <laughs> it was dry when we were in, uh, when we were in Tucson, all the snow had melted, come back from Tucson, the snowstorm rolls in and it hasn't stopped snowing. So. <clears throat> Um, I will not be maintaining the F-16. So the F-16 is actually owned by um, Coco, who did the maidens on the videos down in Tucson. So the videos that you're seeing, Coco uh, was doing the maidens on David's planes, and this is his, uh, his plane. 30 centimeters is a foot. There you go. So yeah, we've had about a foot of snow, give or take. So... <clears throat> Okay, so we got our bypass out, we got our front out. Now we need to take our engine rails out so we can get our tanks out. I've put these engine rails in and out multiple times so far and I think this will be the last time they need to come out and go back in, I hope. We've uh, made quite a few strength changes on the engine area of this aircraft obviously in preparation for the 400 newton engine going in this aircraft but it fits beautifully you just need to make sure that all the structure is appropriate for the engine All right. Okay, so engine rails, simple to take in and out. And now we can pull our tanks out. Just like that, easy peasy. Add them to the messy bench. Awesome. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So now we can bolt our fuselage together. So we're doing a couple additions here as far as the strength goes. Uh, let's see here. Nick said, Coco, be used to it after flying the Bandit. Yeah. Victor said, my wife can 
record Coco flying easier now after doing it for four years. Yeah, no kidding. You kind of learn his, his pattern, right? So, uh, Flying Leduc said, when are you starting the OV-10? So the OV-10 is, I'm going to be unboxing that and uh, just doing the unboxing video. Then it's going to Joe at RC Custom 3D Printing. Joe's going to strip all the, the stuff off, do all the painting and all that. Then it'll be coming back. So it'll probably be back to me in maybe a month or so. But uh, we'll be starting on it whenever it's back from paint. So I'll bring you guys in and then I've got to record this stuff as well. So I'll flip you around. So one of the things with the F-16 here from Skymaster is you do need to keep the um, front of the fuselage removable. I think, I think that's a good idea. Anyways, we want to reinforce our connection point here between the front and the, the main fuselage. Now I've been thinking about this for, uh, well, quite a, quite a few weeks now. Um, I was thinking about maybe doing a pin here in this area, um, but I don't really think that's gonna be super awesome. And the reason for that is our tanks come right up to the front here. So we don't have much room in this area to do anything. Um, so what I was kind of finalized on today is at the very least, we are going to add some more fasteners on this lower portion between the main fuselage and the nose. So instead of just using the three bolts here, we're going to probably add one, two, three, four. That's going to make a, a, the connection a lot stiffer. And then we may put some additional ones right in that location as well too. I'll see how it goes. But uh, the key here is just to, to make all of these areas as strong as possible uh, at the owner's request. All right, so we've got some more questions here. I'm just gonna raise you guys back up. Flip you around. There we go. All right, some more questions. What do we got? Uh, Jagman said on this F16, instead of a sequencer timer for the gear doors, can you have a switch on the gear that gets triggered when the gear goes up and automatically closes the gear doors? Um, you can, there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, this F16, things are a little bit unique because we've got mechanical locks for our gear doors and those need to be sequenced in the whole, um, on, on everything. And the other thing we have is we've got a fail safe or a condition set up where if the pressure drops, so let's, I'll, I'll back up for a second. The fail safe on the gear is probably going to be set to like 60 PSI. So if the gear drops or if the air pressure drops to like 75, those locks will automatically open. And if the air pressure continues to drop and hits 60 or whatever our, our fail safe point is, then the doors will open and the gears will come down. So there's a little, there's things like that. I've, I've heard of optical uh, sensors. So you could use like an optical sensor where it needs to, if you had three, for example, your gear would all need to come up. Um, when, when all three are triggered, um, then your doors would close. Um, but on this F-16, we have those physical locks because the gear is never really fully locked up. Uh, it kind of sags in, in high G pulls. So, um, Living life at 60, how does, sorry, your, your screen name is odd. How does the Transport Canada rules affect flying your jets? Do you need to... Uh, do you need the advanced certificate? Keep up the great work as it got me back into the hobby. Super cool. Um, so you don't need the advanced uh, certificate as long as the field you're flying at doesn't require it. So there are fields now that are in, uh, in whatever airspace, I, I forget what it's called, uh, like Princeton, for example. So Princeton as an event that's about 12 hours west of us and they got the approval, but the pilots need to have the advanced certificate, but they're 
possibly is some leniency there where if there's advanced pilots, you could have basic R-pass pilots there. So it really doesn't affect us now, now that everything's kind of laid out and everything is ironed over and we've got everything uh, sorted out. Uh, Philip asked if the F-16 is going to have an onboard compressor. Yes, absolutely. Basically every uh, large air powered aircraft that we build now always has a compressor. It's like standard issue. Awesome. Usually four kilometers from an aerodrome, yes. That's kind of cool, the overhead view. I like it. How do you guys like the overhead view? Not that there's a choice because we don't have a camera person today. Okay, so I gotta record the video portion of this now. So bear with me. Gotta make sure we get the standard video done. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so we've got our bypass out, we've got our front ducting out, we've got our fuel tanks out. It all comes out quite easy, and we are ready to bolt this fuselage together. Our front tank or our primary tank still needs to be fastened in place, but uh, bolting the fuselage together is the next thing we want to do. Now, we spent a bunch of time thinking on this thing, uh, trying to figure out a more stronger way to join the front fuselage with the main fuselage. Now, the stock system is awesome, works great. I just wanna do it a little bit better. I thought about putting pins in this area here. The problem is the fuel tanks come almost all the way forward. So there's really not a lot of room here for adding a pin that joins the two pieces of the fuselage. So I think what we're gonna do here, cancel that. I think what we're gonna do here is we are going to add some additional fasteners to this V shape in the front here. So probably one, two, three, four. Um, that's probably going to be sufficient overall. We may put a couple more here uh, in this area as well too. We'll see how it works out, but uh, we are going to put some additional fasteners in this aircraft. <coughs> All right. Okay, so that's done. Fuselage over there. Questions? I know it's quiet in the shop tonight. Nobody's here. Stuart from Tasmania, howdy. It's great, we can look at all the eye candy, <laughs> nice. Thank you, Nick. With all that power from the 400, more strength, good idea? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the engine weighs a little bit more, but uh, it's gonna have a ridiculous amount of, of power for sure. So Jagman said, with Jetty, is it possible to control the gyro gain with the Jetty GPS airspeed sensor? So gain automatically increases if you slow down and goes down if you speed up. Yes, absolutely. You just have to set up different conditions for that or um, logic switches. So if you have it set up where if your airspeed is less than 100 miles an hour, your gyro gain is at minus 65. If your speed is over 100 miles an hour uh, to 150, your gain is here. So you can do all that stuff with Jetty, absolutely. Uh, Kelly said, love the MKS carbon servo arms I got from you, very strong. Thanks, Kelly. That's pretty much what we've used almost everywhere on this plane for Coco. The latest ones we just installed, yeah, even the rudder is. The flapper arms here, carbon arms again. Actually, that was the only arm that fit uh, with this layout because you have to put a, a ball joint. <clears throat> Actually, I'll show you. So every other servo arm I had wouldn't actually work because you need to have this ball and arm installed and there needs to be a nut on the back side. And this is the only profile that fits. I have some that are similar that are aluminum but they're too thick and, and you can't put the nut on the back side. So this is pretty much the only one that would work in this scenario and it's, it's a perfect arm for it, so. <clears throat> there we go. 
All right. Uh, yes. Yes, she's got a chute. Well, we don't have the chute yet, but there will be a chute installed. I still have to make the door for this thing. For the chute mechanism. <clears throat> All right, so fuselage front. It's very, very light. Doesn't weigh much at all. And we are ready to bolt that together. That definitely gets a lot longer as soon as you do that. So just going through this process. So if we bolt it together, we can still put all of our stuff back in. Everything in the front end is done, so we are good to go. So we're gonna move the mess this way. <clears throat> this is one of the reasons it's kind of important to label all your stuff as well. Because it becomes very messy, and that's not even including our all of our leads from the back here as well too. It's just a, a mess. Okay, so that's good. Need to figure out our hardware that we're using. Should be these big guys. Nope. <clears throat> Those ones, yes. And we'll confirm on these ones. Should be the same ones. Yes. Okay, so we got our Loctite ready. Got all those ready. We've got big washers. I'm happy that we are doing this because this was the goal for this live. I didn't know how much, uh, how long the comments and, or questions and everything that we covered at the beginning would take. So this first one I'm just putting in to get everything lined up. And uh, then we'll come back and undo this one and Loctite it. So this is just to hold it all together while we get the other guys installed. There we go. So we do have a lot of stuff to fit in this center section because we've got to put our engine control box in here. We've got to put our, um, our onboard compressor in this area. Uh, we don't have a lot of room in the front section actually because the cockpit sits in there. It's kind of a goofy setup from Skymaster. It looks like they originally designed it with a tray to go in here because there's little tray tabs. The downside is if you put the tray in there, the cockpit actually sits on the tray. So everything really needs to be mounted on the actual uh, skin of the nose. So it's a bit of a weird scenario. <clears throat> Let's see here. Tube? Uh, let's see, Stacy said it almost looks like it needs a carbon tube to attach the nose. Nope. A lot of the supports on the, uh, the intake here. So because there's the V, that actually bolts it all together this way as well. So a lot of that support comes from the, uh, the intake. All right. We need to get our little ratchet ready. The appropriate size bit. <clears throat> and this is one of these tools that is insanely helpful in this scenario. So it's the little tiny quarter inch drive ratchet. And it's so nice because you can use this to tighten up those bolts in those tight areas. And uh, you're not having to use an L bend and keep resetting over and over and over again. So, all right, Loctite. Lots of Loctite. So we'll do our front V bolt first. Just to get that lined up. Mm. 
make sure we're in the right spot there. Now when you're doing this type of connection, you wanna make sure you don't tighten up the bolts until they're all installed. So we're gonna get it mostly tight and then uh, not go all the way tight because you may need a little bit of adjustment, a little bit of movement here and there in the entire fuselage um, before everything will actually fit in place. More Loctite, 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 Loctite. And if you guys, again, if you have any questions, let me know. I can definitely do up bolts while I answer questions. <clears throat> Um, we are doing the weathering on this plane as well. I'm actually quite excited to do the weathering. It's been uh, quite a few years since I've done the weathering on an entire aircraft this size. And uh, it's a fun project. I'll be doing a video on that. And of course, sharing it with you guys. The fun thing about doing videos like that is you always get the guys that We'll comment on the video thinking their way is the right way. And ultimately with weathering, it's like so many different ways to do it. There is no right and wrong way. It's all personal preference. So now that I've got both of these um, bolt, bolts done up beside the center one that I put in, they're not done up all the way, they're just loose, but I will take that center one back out and add Loctite now. Nick, no Katie today. No, she's uh, she's away out of town at a volleyball tournament. <laughs> Again, Ed Edgardo, if you a week from today, if you watch the Rebel Pro video, there is an Easter egg at the end of that video in my pictures that will answer your question. Um. Phil said, which Loctite do you use? Um, so I don't know if you're asking about brand, but brand really doesn't matter. Um, I'll, I'll often use the Zap brand. Um, this stuff here, which I just got at my local hobby store. I sometimes have the actual Loctite brand, but this stuff works as well too. Works good. I just buy the big bottles and I fill my little bottle up um, multiple times with the big bottle. But blue is, is kind of common. I, you can use red on the fuselage like this, but blue is, is good, just use a lot of it. Um, can fuel bags be used with both nitro and caro? Um, nitro fuel, I don't know. Uh, kerosene, yes, they're now approved. Um, usually nitro and caro have different properties. So usually like the fuel fittings are different for nitro compared to gasoline and kerosene. Um... <laughs> Nick told you what the speed is. Hey, if David's on and he wants to share the speed, he can, but I, I unfortunately will not share the speed. But again, watch the East, watch for the Easter egg and you'll find out the speed. OK, 
Okay, I get that center one out. Yeah, it's sure a lot quieter doing the lives without a bunch of people here. <laughs> so, hopefully you guys find it just as exciting. It's a little different not having people here to talk to. But I enjoy having you guys here to talk to. getting there. We have the two to do in the tips there, or the V portion. guys are done. Let's see here. So we'll do our two in the V's in the peaks here and then we'll do the two in the V's and that'll be good. And then we'll snug them all down. Let's see here. <clears throat> yeah, it feels like I'm talking to myself, that's for sure. Unfortunately, real afterburners are not allowed, as far as my understanding goes. Joe said, fast enough to know better, slow enough not to get in trouble. Yeah, that's, that's about right. <laughs> uh, Kelly said, oil paints are awesome to use for weathering. If you don't like what you did, you just change it with turpentine. Yeah, exactly. Russell was actually here yesterday, so he stopped in for a little while in the morning just to visit for a bit so see so yeah, it'll be an interesting um weathering session on this guy i think what i've decided i'm going to do is we're going to use oil paints on all of our seam joints or all of our panel lines and rivets um, that's kind of what i've done in the past and uh, then you just wipe it in the direction and then we may go back in with an airbrush and do some airbrushing. So I'm just, I'm gonna see the, the fun thing about weathering, like you just said, Kelly, is it's like, if you don't like what you did, you just take off what you did. So it's, uh, it's fun, I enjoy it. We're getting there. Three more fasteners to go. Man, what a mess. Crazy how much stuff is in here. Jeez. Hundreds and hundreds of feet of airline and cables. Thank goodness for this ratchet. Come on, Ratchet. There we go. Okay. 
Looks like less of a park flyer now. Yes. Um, so Edgardo said, is David planning to have a second paint job with speed? Probably the paint will not last too much. Well, I actually brought, uh, I brought another super bandit back with me and another ultra bandit back with me. They're still in the trailer, but, uh, those will also be, uh, kitted up here as well too. So there's, uh, no shortage of BVM bandits. <clears throat> and yes, as soon as you bolt the nose on this thing, it looks much more appropriate as far as the size goes. Less of a park flyer for sure. All right, one more to do and then we can tighten them all down. Let's see. He needs the quarter scale, yes. Thanks, Tord. Last one, I think I got it. to check from this side and of course the last one is the one that's not lining up properly oh it is perfect that is good All right, so now with all of our uh, fasteners in the aircraft, we will go through and tighten everything down. Which generally you don't wanna do until you've got all your fasteners threaded in because it's, it would make getting them lined up difficult. Or V ones are the ones I'm doing first. And then now I'll start with the center one. And that's gonna, what that's gonna do is suck this fuselage together on the top. We have a bit of a gap in the seam there. And if it doesn't suck it in nicely, what I'll do is slowly do these three all together. But I can see it's doing exactly what I figured it would. Nice. Perfect. I 
Sorry guys, I'm just gonna get all these done up so the Loctite can do its thing and then I'll check for questions and stuff. Just give me a, another two minutes. And now we're doing our ones in the peaks. There she is, all done. Well, stock hardware done. All right. Oh, not many, uh, not many comments. Oh, Russell, you made it. You made it. All right, fuselage is joined. We're done. Build, build finished. And just for fun, we'll just go like this. <laughs> and flip the camera around. Hey, look! That's what some people's installs look like. That's a lot of mess. Crazy. All right, so fuselage bolted together, looks good. This is what I was talking about with the tray. So um, it came with like a big piece of wood, but the thing about the wood is if you actually put it in this area, you can't put anything on top of that piece of wood because when the cockpit sits in here, the base of the cockpit actually sits flush with the top of this former. So um, our equipment needs to go in the base here, actually underneath mounted to the skin of the, uh, of the aircraft. So and that'll be kind of interesting to see how that all works out. But uh, that is the nose bolted on. Super cool. Very nice. Very, very nice. Now we've got to record. Don't forget to record. There we go. Mike from Colorado. Let's see here. I enjoy sitting over the wing when I fly just to study weathering. <laughs> That's awesome. It's actually a really good idea. Katie, you're on. How are you? Katie is with us. She's just not behind the camera. Nice to see you. We got our nose bolted on. Things are going well. Now we need to video. Don't forget the video. Where's my camera? Right there. <clears throat> All right, mic check. Mic is on. All right, so we've got our nose bolted on and we're actually doing a live stream right now. So there's the uh, chat from the live stream. There's our camera from the live stream. And uh, what's the live stream? Well, it's the lighter side of RC After Dark, which is our live stream channel. We do live streams here from the shop every two weeks-ish for about two hours and you guys get to see the behind the scenes stuff. So these guys watching on the live stream right now are actually seeing this about two weeks before you guys are seeing it in the video. So definitely encourage you to check it out, the lighter side of RC After Dark, completely separate channel, but uh, that's where we do our live stream stuff. 
So one of the comments on the live stream was, it looks like a park flyer without the nose on. Well, it looks a heck of a lot better now, much less like a park flyer with that nose bolted on. Really starts to take size and shape once you get the entire fuselage put together and boy, that looks good. So when we put this together, we basically have three bolts on the nose, on the, on the V part of the nose, and we've got one, two, three, four, five fasteners in the actual butt joint. So you get all those done up with Loctite loosely, uh, so you can actually have a little bit of wiggle room to get everything installed. Once everything's in place, then you cinch it down with your Allen key. <clears throat> All right, there we go, video good. Okay, mic is on, good. You couldn't put the equipment on the underside of the tray. Actually, that's a good idea. You totally could. Um, the problem is if you put it on the underside of the tray, the tray is so big. I don't know if you, if you get access to it, if you flipped it over. So I have to take a look at that and see. Um, so Mike, you said is power box maxi wire not available at all anymore. It is available. Uh, we order it from uh, Europe, <laughs> so it's, uh, oh, there we go. Sorry, it, uh, video froze because it said I'm in low power mode. I'm almost out of battery, so. Um, so MaxiWire is available still. North America, it's really difficult to find. I'm not sure if Powerbox USA carries it. Um, our relationship there is a little bit sour. And uh, we actually order our maxi wire from uh, Europe. I'm not sure exactly where, but that's where we order it from. So, um, dun, dun, dun. Philip, you said five by five. I don't know what that means. I don't know what your five by five means. Oh, I forgot to take a video of the mess. Got to do that because that's just fun. <clears throat> and just in case you're wondering why jets are fairly complicated, well, here's all the stuff, the wires. That's not even all the wires, but that's all the wires and tubes and airlines that come from the back part of the plane, the main part of the plane, and all run forward. All right. <clears throat> oh, five by five is a saying in the film crew that all systems are up and running again with camera and audio. Perfect. I learned something today. Yes, Powerbox is still fairly miffed after the radio test. I've moved on. In fact, I've never had an issue at all. Them, not so much. Um, yeah, that's a good accomplishment. I'm happy for that. So, Let's see here, what else can we do now? We gotta pull all of our crap out, get our fuel tanks back in, but we've got to do our main tank up. This gets a little bit sucky at this point because everything is more difficult to access now. That's the problem when you join this fuselage together, but we really had no choice because we couldn't do the install of the turbine, couldn't do the rest of the stuff until we had the fuselage joined together. So that is totally fine. Totally normal. So let's pull the stuff back out for all of our lines and everything. <clears throat> um, the black sheathing right here is fireproof material. So the reason we use that there is because there's no, without doing a hole in the former that the main gear mounts to, uh, there's no, um, good way to mount the uh, the lines and everything coming from the back end. So that's why it runs through the former right here, 
comes beside the turbine. So that's the whole point of that fireproof material is uh, to protect it from the turbine exhaust. So let's see here. I'm gonna do a fair bit of organizing, but that's okay. Cool, so I think we're going to, do you guys have any final questions, ask? But uh, I think we're gonna cut the uh, live stream off uh, 25 minutes early, a little bit early. My voice is starting to disappear and it's becoming a little bit difficult to talk. <clears throat> so if you have any final questions, let me know. Otherwise we accomplish some good things, but. Um, no, I didn't add the extra four bolts for support. I'll do that uh, in the, and that'll be in the normal video, but um, what I'm gonna do is do that in the V 100%. I think we're good on this joint here, but uh, I'm gonna do that on the V itself. So that's just gonna be drilling a hole, screwing that in place. So that'll be fairly simple. Uh, Coco is absolutely an amazing pilot. Um, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal to watch him. Uh, it's phenomenal to stand beside him. And uh, yeah, it's super cool. Coco's an amazing pilot and uh, hat, hats off to him. He's, uh, he's outstanding. I, I love watching him fly his, his airplanes, anybody's airplanes, it's super cool. Awesome. Cool guys, well I think that's going to wrap everything up. Um, thanks for hopping on the live stream and thanks for participating. And uh, yeah, Victor's got a ton of uh, video of Coco flying on his, um, his channel as well too. <laughs> so anyways, uh, thanks guys for watching. That's it. We'll see you next time. See you in the next live two weeks from tonight. And uh, that's it. Thank you.